Thank you. 
손 잡아 주리라 나의 안에 거하라 나는 내 하나님이니 모든 환란 가운데 너를 지키는 자 두려워하지 말라 내가 널 도와주리라 놀라지 말라 내손 잡아 주리라 내가 너를 지명하여 불렀나니 너는 내 것이라 내 것이라 너의 하나님이라 내가 너를 고배롭고 존 손 잡아 주리라 내가 너를 지명하여 불렀나니 너는 내 것이라 내 것이라 너의 하나님이라 Very good morning. Let's rise and just greet one another with the love of the Lord. Say peace. <laughs> Peace of the love be with you and with you. Wow, special effects. I want to appreciate everyone who made the effort to show up in ethnic clothing. This is the second missions weekend, so we try. But more than that, it's really to come before the Lord, the Lord of salvation. To worship Him, to give Him thanks, to rejoice in the salvation we know. And to carry His heart with us because there are so many more who needs to know him amen and so as we worship let's focus on the lord and let the holy spirit do what he wants to do let's just look to him father we thank you bring us together we want to just come around your throne heavenly father to worship you thank you for sending jesus all the way to us god who made the way who is the truth and is the life that we have and so today we just want to pour our hearts out to you lord once again have your way and thank you for your grace it is so sweet to trust in jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to
church, now that you know the lyrics of this song, let's just use this start, use this time to just worship the Lord. We will use these lyrics as a declarative prayer and a declarative worship unto the nations. We will pray for every nation that our missionaries are in. We declare this over every single country that does not know Christ. So even as we sing this song again, let us use this time and declare this over every single person that does not know God. Hallelujah. They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. Sing it together. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. We together right now. So much power in your name.
every heart. Hallelujah. We want to just declare the greatness of God and the reality of Jesus in every single person that we encounter. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
There's healing, there's forgiveness, there's peace, there's joy. And we want to lift up your name this morning here. And we want to say hallelujah. Right? Can you join me to say one, two, three, hallelujah. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. And thank you, worship team. It was such a wonderful time of worship. Uh, maybe you can just uh, uh, remain standing. You can just look around. Maybe it's a bit hard to see in, uh, in this light. But just look around. You know, some of us here, you know, we're wearing the ethnic costume here because this is the second week of our missions weekend and uh, you can see someone in a different ethnic costume, right? Can you just say, uh, God bless you? <laughs> now, if you see someone else who is not in an ethnic costume, right? You just say, God bless you too. <laughs> Alright, man. Okay, yeah, you can take a seat when you're done, right? All right, is there anyone here who is with us for the first time or first few times? Could you just uh, raise your hand? Anyone here? I hear some clapping. I assume there is. Yeah, there are some over there. All right, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And also for those of you who are watching online, if you are joining us for the first few times as well, you can uh, scan the QR code that will lead you to a visitor's uh, form. And for those of you, of you who, have, who have just raised your hands, right, our ushers uh, will be coming to you. We'll pass you a welcome back. At inside the welcome back, there is a visitor's card, right? Uh, and you can fill that up and we would like to get to know you a little bit better uh, after the service. So after the service, right, don't rush off. Uh, you can go exit the auditorium, turn right, there is a welcome corner over there where we would like to, you know, get to know you a little bit better uh, over a cup of coffee, right? So today, as you have uh, known by now, it's the second week of uh, Missions Weekend. And so, um, actually, there's, uh, there are some missions booths outside as well. So after the service, feel free to check out all the booths. But before that, right, we have got a video to share with you about our church in Osaka, Japan, right? So uh, just sit back and watch this video. Join us 
to serve the Japanese, to bring love in action to the Japanese. It was my oasis, former hobby, to come to Kuz of Kaka. After I come here, my thinking changed and I learned how to love and I get many love from them. God is right here in Osaka and He needs us to rise up to become agents of change and transformation for this land. God is asking you to come here to plough the land, to sow the seed and to reap the harvest. How many of you are excited when you see this video? Raise your hands. Anyone? Right, so please sign up for this, right, go for this. If you're not excited, right, you should eat all the more go. Then you will be more excited when you go. All right? So uh, later on, right, outside uh, the booths as well, you have, uh, if you have come in from this side, you have noticed uh, a huge world map uh, at the atrium. Right, we know that many among us here have also been reaching out to the nations in various ways. So uh, we want to acknowledge all the outreach efforts that you have been doing as well. And so we invite you to write down uh, on a uh, post-it and on a piece of paper to stick it on the map. So if you go outside over there, you'll see what you can do. Right, stick up, uh, write, uh, the place, write, write, put it on the paper, the places that you have been reaching out to, and then you place it on the world map so we can also see you know, uh, oh, what God is doing in our midst as well. All right, uh, and on stage here, you can see two paintings uh, for this missions weekend. Uh, there, they, they come with, of course, a special message with the painting as well. So to find out more, uh, you can uh, download uh, the painting in our visual arts group, uh, and then you can uh, also view it on our Insta uh, Telegram channel as well. Right on top of that, just now you have seen uh, co-leading the worship is uh, Joshua Ku, who is one of our missionaries uh, based in uh, Thailand in Chiang Mai. So uh, his wife Sharon have also got a book uh, out there for sale. So if you are interested, please drop by the booth as well. Right next up, we have got an uh, announcement on the registration for AGM and the opening of nominations uh, for PCC. Right, so uh, this is a reminder. We have already uh, made the announcement last week, uh, but which is just to remind us that uh, the registration is now open. And the meeting is on Thursday, 23rd May at 8 p.m. So confirmed members of KUS who are on our electoral roll and who are at least 17 years of age are invited to join us. So you can't go to NS yet, but you can uh, vote. Right? We'll be providing dinner one hour before the AGM and our parochial church council, the PCC, will host you. Uh, so come to, uh, and fellowship together and sign up uh, at the link over there, the go.kuso.org.sg slash AGM. Right, this is also a time for electing any new PCC members as well who are church members and they can bring about their expertise in different fields to collectively support and advise on the management of KUS and the resources that God has blessed us with. Right, so they serve in a voluntary capacity and nominations can be submitted at the website as well. So refer to the link for more details. And if you can't remember all the details, all the announcements that uh, I've just made, you can check our KUS Telegram channel. Uh, that's where our latest updates will be uh, uploaded. Right? And if you need assistance with our events or activities in KUS, right, feel free to approach our admin desk or any of the staff here uh, after the service as well. Right? So now let's uh, prepare our hearts to give God His tithe and our offerings. Uh, for those of us who want to give uh, physically, you can drop them on the, at the offering boxes on your way out. Uh, and if you want to give electronically, you can scan this QR code over here. Or just give us some time to uh, scan if you want to give electronically. And shall we pray? Father God, we just want to say what a privilege it is to partner you in the work that you are doing. Uh, and Lord, we want to pray, God, as we give, Lord, would you refresh us and download onto us right, the vision that you have for this world and refresh us with, a, uh, with, with all the love and all the experiences that you have brought us through and make us excited for more, especially for the people around us. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now shall we put our hands together to welcome uh, Reverend Chris to give us uh, the sermon for today. Sembeskano. <laughs> And you must say, Sen. One more time, huh? Senbeskano. What does that mean? That means, how are you? And you just say, Sen. As we say, you must say another word, me. Sen, me. <laughs> Sen means good. Uh, Senbeno means, how are you? And when a person is speaking to a crowd, he will always say, Senbeskano. Right? So, today, I'm here to bring you a flavour of Mongolia. Obviously, that's where I went to. This is called a Mongolian deal. You must be wondering, this must be very hot inside here, right? 
I say, yeah, obviously, because this is for winter. And you may be wondering, eh, hey, no pocket around here. Actually, there's one big pocket over here where I can put my handphone and my private aircon here, okay? <laughs> so today is very special because this is the second week for our Mission Emphasis Weekend. In 1995, I went to a World Student Prayer Meeting and for the very first time, I was praying for Mongolia. Now, how many of you have been on a mission trip before, Rizan? A short mission trip. How many of you have never been on a short-term mission trip? Don't, don't include your holiday shopping and all these other things. Mission trip. Rizan, never been on a mission trip, alright? Not a lot. Those of you who have raised hands, I see your hands. After the message, you can come forward, I can pray for you. It is a wonderful thing to experience mission. And in 1995, when I was at a prayer meeting, I heard for the very first time that there is a country called Mongolia that do not have a Bible in their own language. So we started praying for a Korean couple who was sent out there to translate Bible and also do student work. That was the beginning of a personal desire and prayer that one day I could visit this nation and hopefully share the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone who do not know Jesus. And so in my final year in my Bible college, I voted to go to Mongolia to write my thesis. And so in 2004, for the very first time, I went into this big refrigerator in a city called Ulaanbaatar. It was minus 25 degrees. When I went out of the airport, the, my, the missionary pushed me back and put another two layers on me because it was so cold. And it was also the very first time I see a camera eye to eye. I've never seen and been to a nation where I actually see snow. That was the very first time I see snow-capped mountains and actually saw hairy cows known as yigs. And also the very first time I see all these goats and sheep. And I thought to myself, wow, it's really difficult to differentiate between sheep and goats. So it was a very interesting experience. In fact, during my trip, I traveled to Mongolia, or some would call Outer Mongolia, the Mongolian Re People's Republic, and also Inner Mongolia, a province in China. And when I was there, I used different modes of transport. In, what, in fact, it, that year, it was the first time I used so many different kinds of transport. On scooter, you know, on bus, on train. Halfway through, they would change the wheels of the train. And then, aeroplane on horse and on camel. Oh, but this one, just for photo taking. <laughs> when I was there, I also experienced some culture shock. For the very first time, I entered a toilet that I didn't want to do anything there. <laughs> I also met some amazing people and these people, I really grown to love. Some are young, some are old, some are traditional. They spoke a different language and then I realized they are also in need of the same saviour that I know. Once we went to a marketplace called Selling Hawked, and in this place, we were trying to reach out to a lady that selling stuff. And as we were talking to her, we, sh we told her about Jesus Christ, and I thought to myself, anyone who have heard of the name Jesus, right? But to my surprise, she has never heard of Jesus. In fact, she thought Jesus was something that she could eat. And so I realized there are people who are unrich, 100% unrich, who has never heard about the good news of Jesus Christ. It was at that moment I realized there are still many people out there. You may not know them, but God knows them. They have never heard about the gospel. And in my trip, we had took a six hours ride into this very remote area to reach out to nomadic people. And it was there. We went into this family and shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the very next day, the whole family said this, because you have traveled so far to tell us about God. In fact, it was the very first time they have seen Singaporean. So they said this, because you have traveled so many miles all the way here in this remote tent, now we believe. And that morning, the family gave their life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. <laughs> Together with me, I saw a missionary who has been out there plowing and sowing for 15 years to nomadic people. I've never seen someone came to Christ. She was in her tears. And she, in tears, she said that 
it was such a touching moment to see nomadic family accepting Jesus. And with that, I want you to remember what Jesus said in John 10. We know John 10.10, 10, everybody can memorize that, right? The thief come to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I've come so that my sheep will have life in abundance. We can quote this. And we always think about the thief like the devil is the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But in context, it was referring to the Pharisees. And then in context, Jesus was saying that I'm the gate. And then in verse 16, he says this. And I have other sheep. Say it together with me. Other sheep. One more time, louder. Other sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. When I was in Mongolia, I realized that there are other sheep that Jesus knew about. There are other sheep that I didn't know. In fact, I thought it is too far to go out there to the remotest part of Mongolia. And yet, Jesus knows about them. And today, I want you to know this other sheep needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. How are these sheep to know? How are they to know? Unless someone would go. And Paul says it clearly in Romans 10, verses 14 to 15. I want you to read it loud and clear. Go. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach Good news. So friends, we are the sent ones. Last week, if you heard Pastor Chris Long, you know, we have many Chris preaching over these few weekends. Uh, the long one, the short one is here. But last week, his title was very clear, isn't it? God's last command is our first priority. But you maybe would think about this and say, Pastor, it's so risky to go out there because it's dangerous. It is dangerous. Sometimes you do dangerous things in mission field. When we were traveling on the snow, we were actually driving without any chains. And it was quite slippery. We just only pray. Sometimes you do not know what you eat. You just make sure you close your eyes, pray, and then close your eyes and eat. Because the more you ask, the more you will not have your dinner that day. So sometimes it's scary, it's dangerous. But you know what? It is important for our faith to take some risks. Because Hassan Taylor says this, if there is no risk in your exploits for God, there is no need for faith. And so friends, our faith is not meant to be private. Many know what they are saved from, but many people, many Christians do not know what they are saved for. You know what you are saved from, but you do not know what you are saved for. God saved us, gave us a new identity for the purpose of making a difference to others. But you know what? I have been the one that always been telling God, God send me, send me. But right now, I'm still here in Singapore. For many years, I've been preparing to be a missionary. I was together with uh, Daniel Ning. We, we were in this uh, uh, team together. We are all going to different places, getting trained. And uh, you know, all these missionaries that were together with me when I was a missionary in turn in Church of Our Saviour, they have all gone to the field and they have come back already. It means they retire from the field and they are coming back. And I'm still here. And I've always introduced myself as the missionary wannabe. <laughs> and to cut a long story short, in 20, 2012, I was supposed to go to Mongolia long term. And I was in 2011, my wife gave birth to my third child. And that was the time when I was seriously considering, wow, last time I only need to go with one child. Then after that, oh, maybe two child still okay. Three children, wow, a bit hard, right? And so we started talking to different ones and many of my mentors started to say, Chris, you know what? You're better as a mobilizer. Maybe you should stay in Singapore and be a pastor. You're doing a good job in the Chinese church. And so I thought to myself, okay, since I cannot go, I go to the Chinese church and speak Chinese. I cannot speak Mongolian. At least I can speak in Chinese. And that's how I ended up in Chinese ministry. And then I've been there for 18 years. But from 2012 to 2016, I was a bit upset. Uh. I was upset with God and many people because I said, you know God, so many people don't want to go. I want to go. But yet, you sent them. You didn't send me. 
You know, the thing that I didn't want to do was that I didn't want to be an ordained pastor. From very young, I already said, God, we have, you know, this conversation. Huh? I will be a missionary, but don't make me a pastor in a local church. <laughs> and guess what? Now I'm an ordained pastor in the Anglican Diocese. The thing that you resist the most, God will give you as a present. <laughs> and sometimes I talk to myself, I say, I think God knows best. And I think there's a purpose for all of us. So today, I want you to know that in 2016, I began to be challenged again. There was a, a Malaysian pastor came over, started to talk about mission, and that's where my heart is stirred. And I said, maybe I should go back to Mongolia and bring teams over there. I didn't know whether we're going to make any difference, but you know what? Let's go. And let's just do something for them. And so we went. And every year we went, we developed the team. We helped the team to grow. And this is a video like a summary of our few years there. This is a video in 2017. I'm going to show you what we have done there and maybe this will bless you. While I was praying, the door to my, the gateway to my heart and soul was open, and I had this very strange feeling. And without my control, I started crying tears, and in, in my eyes, I could see my past and all my memories. He's seen his mistakes come before his eyes. He doesn't want to repeat those mistakes again. He wants to be strong and he wants to also be on a team like you guys to also spread, help spread God's word. <laughs> Come to this camp on the train. I also thought, oh well, they're not going to this camp. I'm gonna have to play with a bunch of little kids and everything. One <laughs> coming here, I never really thought that there was Jesus Christ. I didn't really believe he existed. Wow. From seeing all of your examples and hearing your testaments, I understood that there is Christ, and that I have to go to church and know more. I learned that I must pray and that I must like, be in good relations with others. And I learned a lot of things I didn't know and I also found a lot of things that I hadn't found before. 
Church of our Savior, and uh, thank you so much for Reverend Daniel, uh, Daniel V. Eric Chen, and uh, for uh, your team was great. We just became one family. Yes, we love God and talk God and serve God honestly. And thank you so much for your team was really inspiring us and also touching our kids' heart. So thank you so much, and also. Thank you for uh, sending in support for our outreach. We really thank God for partnering with us and supporting with us. Not only sending money, also sending team to work together. Thank you so much. Well, let's give glory to God. I'm still in touch with Pastor Maida and Pastor Odi. We are still connected. And the last I heard was this uh, children that's grown up to be teenagers. Some of them are, are beginning to attend some classes with YWAM. And they are also planning to reach out to other places. Come on, let's give glory to God. And we thought that maybe we are only just a team out there for a week. We cannot do much, but you can make a difference. So today I've titled the message as Go Mad. Turn to your neighbor and say, Go Mad. <laughs> Go make a difference. Sometimes it really requires for us to be a little bit mad, you know, like wearing winter clothes uh, in Singapore. <laughs> but you know what? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And John Song was a man like that. He was born in 1901 in Fujian province. He left for America in 1920 and earned his undergraduate, graduate and postgraduate degrees in five and a half years and later on returned to China, determined to be a preacher. John Song was the son of a Chinese Methodist preacher. And when he was young, People call him the little preacher. So he was very excited. But when he went to America, through the studies, through the seminary, which actually taught a lot of liberal theology, teach a lot of syncretistic belief, he actually felt that he has lost his faith and he was not interested in the Bible anymore. But it was not until there was this 15-year-old girl shared her testimony in a church that impressed him deeply. And he recognized him himself as a sinner for the very first time and needed God's forgiveness. And he could not get rid of Christ's question that says this, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So in February 1927, he read the story of the crucifixion and asked God for forgiveness. Immediately, something changed in John's song. He was joyful. He was excited. His writings, his preaching was different. He was very animated. And he was so convicted that he was passionate about telling people to repent. And because of that, people would think that he's a little bit crazy. In fact, at one stage, they asked him and admitted him to a mental hospital. And he was there for about six months. And in that period, he read the Bible 40 times. And John Song said that that was the best Bible seminary that he has ever attended. It was through that reading of the Bible, through the Holy Spirit, that he really encountered God. And when he came out, he went to China and also to Singapore and many places to preach the gospel. And one of the experiences when people were saying he was crazy, there was this professor who was very interested to find out what happened. So he went to his church when he was preaching, was wearing three layers to preach because he's always giving illustration. And so he was standing at the back 
And when he was preaching, he took out the first layer of clothes and in the second layer, there was all these notes about bitterness, adultery, lying, cheating, and all this sin that people have committed in the second layer. And he said, many of you are using your own outer layer clothes to cover up what you are doing that God is displeased. And when he opened up, he said, God, today is revealing all your sins. And then he took out the second layer and revealed a white layer and said, if you come to Jesus, you can be completely clean. And in the altar call, he pointed to the congregation and said, those who have committed adultery, come out right now. This kind of altar call, most pastors won't do. <laughs> All right? And the professor thought that nobody would come out. But to his surprise, he said, people were weeping and crying and coming forward. And then he said, those who have cheated in the business, come out right now. Those who have lied, come out right now. And people start weeping and crying. Clearly, there was a revival. And the professor, on the very day when he witnessed this, said this. He said, this man is not mad. Nobody who have made such an altar call will be able to get any response. And yet, we see the power of God convicting the hearts of men. And so he responded. Later on, he became the president, uh, principal of a Bible college and he was recounting this experience. And then he concluded by saying this, that Jong Song was not a mad person. In fact, he was a very smart man. He's a wise person. He has a PhD. But he was willing to be mad for Jesus. Willing to be crazy for the sake of the cross. And he quoted these words. Man's work do not even come close to the works of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not work, all the efforts of man will come to naught. So today, if we want to be mad, to want to make a difference, we need to first of all be informed. Be informed about what God said and what is happening in the world. Do you know there are 7.95 billion people in this world and there's only 691 million evangelical Christians? It's less than 1%. In Mark 16, 15, it says this, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Clearly, this is not an option. There is no choice when you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Singaporeans, especially Christians, don't like the word compulsory. You have to compulsory come to church. You have to compulsory do this. Nobody like this word. But to be honest, the Bible kind of say, this is God's command. It is God's DNA. It is the DNA of a Christian to go. But cultural Christianity says it differently. What is cultural Christianity? Cultural Christianity wants God's love but not God's commands. But today, I want to tell you that Church of Our Saviour is a church that believes in fulfilling the Great Commission and not to omit the Great Commission. This is not the Great Omission, but the Great Commission. Someone say Amen. You know, yesterday I was in this uh, diocese conference and the Archbishop of Singapore was preaching. And in his preaching, he reminded all Anglicans, he said, by right, Anglicans have no choice. And then he pointed to the clergy, all of us. Lah. He said, clergy, all the more don't have any choice because when we were about to be ordained, we have to sign a document, a legal document. It's our canonical obedience that wherever the bishop sent us, we will go. Whatever the bishop posts us, we will say yes and hallelujah. And so he said this, you know, actually as a disciple, you know, you all have no choice. And then the next statement was very important. He said, but sometimes it's good to have no choice because it teaches us to learn the beauty about surrendering and submission. Right? It helps us to understand that He is God and we are supposed to respond to Him. But we know that even though we have all this knowledge, we still come up with many excuses. Uh, some, sometime when me and our senior pastor, we go rock climbing. We always have a lot of excuse for the route that is very difficult. And then he will tell me, my hand too short. <laughs> there was once I believe him. I stood beside him. And then we, we measure our... Because we're about the same height. Like both of us are short. So we want to see whose hand is shorter. And so I say, oh, his hand really shorter. So I say, well, you have a good excuse. Your span is short. But then another day, I, I went to another gym. Uh. Then I said, hey, last time we measured wrongly. Uh. Like that, not accurate. We must measure back to back. 
back to back. Eh? I measure back to back. And it turned out that we've got the same length. <laughs> then I turned to you and say, hey, no more excuse. Huh? Then you say, oh, today I never eat. <laughs> so we can come up with all kinds of excuses. All kinds of excuses just not to do this, right? And Christians have many excuses. In fact, in the early 80s, there was this song about getting an excuse not to go to the mission field. I don't know whether you have heard of it before. The title of the song is called, Please Don't Send Me to Africa. I'm going to let you listen to the song. But I, I, I assure you, whenever you tell God, please don't, uh, then God will convince you. <laughs> Just like me. No, please don't make me a pastor. In the end, I become a pastor. <laughs> but today, I not only want you to be informed that this is not an option, I want to debunk some myths about cross-cultural mission. The first myth is this. Cross-cultural missions is only for super-on Christians. <laughs> I thought it was so when I was very young. But this is a myth. Because cross-cultural mission is the responsibility for all Christians. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's also for you. Now recently, we are kind of uh, reshaping and uh, kind of reordering the missions department. And then I turned to Pastor Vanager and say, you know what, we should close down mission department. And he said, huh, close down mission department. And I explained why. I said that there shouldn't be any mission department in any church because we the church are the mission department. We are the mission department. Because if you think about it, if I ever set up an evangelism department, you'll be thinking, that's the job of the evangelism department, right? Now, I won't be evangelizing. And how come no evangelism? Ah, those in the evangelism department did not produce any programs for us. And so sometimes with the understanding of a missions department, whose work is not to organize missions only for you, but to coordinate and to actually take care of some of our missionaries, and there's a lot of coordination work to be done. We forgot and think that everything about missions, we push it to the mission department. So today, I want you to know, you are already in the missions department as long as you're in Kuz. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are in missions department. <laughs> because we are the missions department. The second myth I want to debunk is this. Cross-cultural missions is imposing Western ideologies on cultures. Now, first of all, Christian faith did not come from the West, but from the Middle East. Secondly, being Christian doesn't mean being Western. So this is a myth. God is not interested to make all of us the same. In fact, in many cultures, when they receive Jesus, they retain their culture. And if you look in the book of, book of Acts, when the early Christian have Gentile coming to faith, they were arguing and 
kind of having a meeting, a big, long meeting and debate to ask one another, what should we ask them to keep? What should we ask them not to keep? And so after the Jerusalem council, the leaders of the early church decided that the Gentile church do not need to be the same as the Jewish people, but should abstain from things that are wrong before the eyes of God. And so in Acts 15, 19 to 20, this is their conclusion. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. And so they maintain their own culture that is not religious, that is not abhorrent before God. And so you can see that in many cultures, they still have their own costume and their own culture as long as not against God's law. And so in Mongolia, when I go to a church, it is not the kind of building that you are familiar with. This is a Mongolian girl, a Mongolian tent. Third myth, I should wait till my own family members are saved before going out. Now some of you may be thinking, my parents are not safe. My family members are not safe. Why should I go out there to reach out to others when my own families are not safe? And if you are thinking like this, I want to encourage you that it is not about reaching this or that. It is about reaching this and that. So it is not all, but and. We need to do both. We need to understand that this is a myth. Missions is not about prioritizing who, but prioritizing what. Turn to your neighbor and say this statement. It's not who, but what. So in Ecclesiastes, 11, the author clearly tells us to invest. In verse 1, he says, cast your bread among many waters for soon you will find it. When calamity comes, when disaster comes, you will know what to do. And then in verse 4, he says that he who observes the wind will not sow and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Now to a farmer, it's important to look at the weather before you actually sow anything, isn't it? But he's referring to those people who keep looking at the weather and not doing anything who is procrastinating and who keep hesitating. And he said to those people, you will never reap anything. And so this is important for us to know you need to reach your family members. Yes, at the same time, reach out to others. Fourth myth, I don't have a calling to be a missionary. This is clearly a myth because you don't have to be a missionary to be involved in missions. How do you know how to be involved in missions? Go out to the atrium later on and talk to some people with a line out. The last one, cross-cultural missions is just a quick-fix solution to poverty with no impact on communities. Now, you must understand that many missionaries in the past built schools and hospitals to help the poor and to educate them so that they can be elevated from their poverty and they could impact their own communities. So this is a myth. And in KUS, we partner with an organization called Sword and Light in Batam with a pastor by the name of William. And they are doing such an amazing work there. Some of you have been on short trips before. If you have never, I encourage you to go on one. They will go out to the slum area, talk to these families, and encourage them to come to their school to be educated. And so they will interview them and bring them out. And in the graduation, they'll be educated. And slowly, they will be able to find jobs. So this part of mission is to elevate them out of their poverty and to break the cycle of poverty. And so praise God that Church of Our Saviour is also involved in some of this work. So be informed. And next, be involved. Turn to your neighbour and say, be involved. You cannot just talk about it, inspired by it and not do anything. It's like watching the exercise video without doing any exercise. So how can you be involved? Number one, you can pray for missions. Go to the booth outside, start praying for uh, the things that's listed there. Last prayer and praise, we prayed for a missionary who got stroke. And he, she came back from Osaka on a wheelchair. And today, I saw her in our midst. Anne, can you stand up? You know, the power of prayer to see her well and worshipping with us. Come on, let's give glory to God. Thank you, Anne. It's just amazing because we are seeing how God is answering our prayers. We are seeing how when we start to pray for missions, things start to happen. You can be involved in praying because you can witness God's incredible miracle. Number two, you can also give to missions. 
You know, in the Bible, when Paul was going to different places to preach the gospel, he was constantly collecting money for the Jerusalem church because the Jerusalem church was being persecuted. And today, our church is also involved in giving. We have given to different missions, to Pakistan, to Africa, to Mongolia, Nepal, Japan, Bobonaro, Sri Lanka, and many, many more. And you can see, they even have our logo there. And I'm very excited because when, just a few days ago, they were just sending me pictures of how they were baptizing people in the river in Pakistan. And through your giving, there are people who need a support who can do the work there. But giving them is not just to give them the fish. We are also empowering people, elevating them out of poverty. In one instance, I was in Mongolia and I was taking a team there. We were preparing a camp for them. And then I was told by the organizer that they were expecting us to pay for their camp and to pay for our airfare, <laughs> of course, to pay for everything. And they have about, you know, 20 to 30 students there with workers, maybe 40. And so we have to go to this place and we have to cover the whole uh, transport and, and booking of the place. And I was quite shocked and a little bit annoyed. And I said, why is this uh, given to us? Because we have paid a lot for the trip. And he said, oh, all the missionary does that. So I thought to myself, maybe it's good for me to go and give a discipleship lesson there. <laughs> so I went back there. Truly, we paid for the camp. But after the camp was over and they were very excited, we saw many people safe. And then I told them, I said, you have to be involved in, in, in giving too. You may be poor, but however, I believe that whatever you give, God is pleased. Because I'm interested in asking also the Mongolians to give to mission, to be part of mission. So I taught them and we did a collection. And that very night, I believe uh, Pastor Debbie was there. We, we saw the Mongolians, you know, struggling to give one dollar. You know, I do not know how many Toguru they have. They just put in everything. And because of that, our whole team, our whole team gave generously. Some of us were keeping money for our r and started to open up our wallet and pour everything inside. And we had a great collection. And so the next year we came with this collection and we heard one of the youth wanted to go there and serve in a camp. And we make this rule. We say everyone who serves must also pay a little bit, whatever they can give. Pay a little bit to come to the camp. And so she said she has no money. She came from the slum, but she has a handful. And so the organizers said, you know, you cannot come to the camp unless you pay. So she decided to pawn her phone. And so she pawned her phone. She got rid of the phone. She got the money. She paid for the camp. And she came to the camp to serve as a cook so that she can reach out to the children there. And when she shared the story, we were very touched. And we knew that it was something, it was a worship. We're not trying to make things difficult for them. Clearly, I did not make that rule. <laughs> I, I only tell them, you know, you need to do something. And so when that was being done, something changed in their attitude. Because giving is not about the amount, it is about the attitude. It is about the attitude of worship to God. And so when that happened, everybody started giving. The Mongolians started giving. The Singaporeans started giving. The people from the nations started giving. And I said, every year you should have a pool to support the next camp. And so people start to give generously. And so we begin to see how God touched the people. And of course, after the camp, we went to buy the phone back and return her. And we wanted to tell them, the message is clear. That if God so loved the world that He gave Himself for us, how much more should we not give to God? And it was City Star who said this, if Jesus Christ is God and died for us, there is no sacrifice that is too great for me to make for Him. Amen? All the sacrifices that you have, your giving is nothing comparable to what Jesus Christ has given to all of us. And so, in my understanding and in their understanding right now, giving is a joy. We give not to get back from God. We give not to be blessed more. We give only because we want to worship this Jesus and He is deserving of all that we give to Him. Amen? And that's the heart of giving. So give to missions and grow in missions. Grow in missions. When you go out there, go and check out this course that's available. In fact, there was a zone 
that has completed this course. It's called Unfinished Story. This is a course about cross-cultural missions. It gives you the broad picture, the big picture about missions work. So if you want to go on a short-term missions, maybe this year or next year, maybe you can go for this course. So check it out when you go out there. And finally, be engaged in missions. Next year, we are hoping to send out 100 mission teams from KUS to the different nations. Do you think it can be done? Well, that's a very miserable yes by 3%. <laughs> can, can we do better? Do you think we can, we can do it? <laughs> okay, that means you have to sign up. You have to be part of it. You have to be engaged, either as a sender, intercessor, mobilizer, goer, or welcomer. You know, our missionaries sometimes come back. We have uh, Pastor Joshua and his wife, Sharon. Josh, you want to stand up? Okay, just now he was leading worship. He has been serving and he's still serving in Thailand as a missionary. Sharon has a book table out there. In order to support them, go there, say hi to them, say some nice thing to them and say some Thai word. Uh, the, but the most important thing you can bless them with is to go there and buy two copies. Why two copies? One for yourself, one to give others. And you, in so doing, you can support them. But welcoming is not just welcome missionaries, I was told. We are also welcoming some of the foreigners who have come into Singapore. Because the missions is also an outdoor step. And if you can reach out to some of these foreigners, when they go back to their nation, they could probably start a church. So let us be involved and finally be responsive. Be responsive. You can hear all these things and not be responsive. What is mission? Mission is when you see, you will do it. When you see the need, you will fulfill the need. Many of you will know that our senior pastor, it's not that he's very free, he's very busy yet, he accidentally planned a church in Africa. In fact, two churches in Africa. And so we were very interested. So we gathered around him and said, Pastor, how do you do it? He said, oh, I was on this chat, you know. He, he planted a church in Africa without going to Africa. Maybe he sang the song, Please Don't Send Me to Africa. <laughs> but God sent Africa to him. So he said he was in this uh, Hebrew chat group and he was conversing and there was this guy, an African guy, who said, can anybody teach me about the Bible? And everybody else said, this is not a group to talk about the Bible. So they actually scold him and, and shame him. But our senior pastor took pity on him, private text him, and saw the need. And he said, maybe I could teach him the Bible. And they got connected and they wanted our senior pastor to be on a Zoom call. And on the first Zoom call, he saw four Africans there. And so he said, wow, this is getting serious. And ever, ever since that Zoom call or that video call, he has been preaching to them every Sunday in the evening. And from four person, you know, they grew. When they talk about baptism, they went to the sea and baptized themselves. <laughs> when they talk about reaching the nation, they went to another village and preached the gospel. And now, it's not just in Kenya, there's another place, Tanzania. Uh, they, they planted a group. And just, just now, they just sent our senior pastor a photo of their outreach and look at the number of people that has gathered. Come on, let's give glory to God. And guess what? They planted a church and they decided to call that church, Church of Our Saviour. <laughs> God clearly is doing something. Now, we all know that our senior pastor is very smart. His IQ is very high and he can speak many different languages. But I think... I think the credit goes beyond just his ability. Amen? I think it was God who was working through him because he saw the need. And God used him in his broken African language, his uh, very bad connection to Africa, and yet can bring about a church in Africa. Praise the Lord. Because when God is at work, we just don't become the barrier and be part of it. Amen? Proverbs 11.25 says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. For those of you who have been on mission trip, you will also agree with me that when you come back, you're more blessed than what you have given, isn't it? We thought that we are going there to bless them. Oh, they're poor thing, poor thing. But in the end, we are so much blessed by them, by their hospitality, by their heart, by their attitude, by their hunger for God, by the way they worship. They don't have any instruments, but all of them were singing from their heart and their lungs, and it was so loud. I went to a, 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 a preach in a very small church in Indonesia once, and it was so loud. Just the singing itself is so loud. And I was so blessed. I could actually sense the presence of the Lord in that place without understanding the language. I was so blessed. If you 
are able to refresh others, you will find that you too will be refreshed. And so back to our work in Osaka and Bobonaro. Friends, these are two places that we have been commissioned to plant churches there. Just last year, we started services in Osaka. In Bobonaro, many of our missionaries have come back, but the work is still needed. And so this year, I went there and I realized that we need to continue our medical missions. And we wanted to set up some fast internet. In fact, in June, we have a brother by the name of Andrew. Andrew Farm is going there to set up some fast internet so that in due time, maybe our youths and their youths can connect through internet. And through that, maybe we can start a ministry there. We also have our work in Osaka. Please pray for more baptism. In fact, please pray for baptism because we have seen some people coming to Christ, but there are nobody coming forward for baptism. Last year was my very first time going into Japan. I know many of you have been to Japan to, to have a holiday with your family. Consider going to Japan to have holiday and mission. <laughs> Visit our church. Do something there. And so last year when I went there, it was also part holiday, part mission. I was preaching there and I prayed to God. I said, God, let the people respond. And when I did the altar call, I spoke in English and I had Japanese words on my slides. Five person raised their hand to respond. And Pochu say that some of them truly have come to know Christ. Come on, let's give glory to God. Because for many years, Japan has been a graveyard for missionary. Until today, after so many things have been done, it is still less than 1% of evangelical Christians. So there is a Macedonia call for all of us. Macedonia call. When Paul was about to go to Mysia, he was going through this place called Mithnia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go to. And so passing through Mysia, he went out to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There was a man of Macedonia standing there urging him to come over to Macedonia. And so in verse 10, it says this, And when Paul had seen the vision, is it in Macedonia the vision was given? No, before he entered Macedonia. He has seen the vision and the next word, can we say it out loud together? Go. One more time. Immediately, the whole team, we sought to go on into Macedonia. Friends, God has spoken to some people, but many of us will only respond much later. We procrastinate and we think that maybe we heard wrongly. We need first confirmation, second confirmation, third confirmation, fourth confirmation. And all our life, we have been confirming and confirming and confirming. And even after being confirmed, we still think that that's not good enough because we did not respond as what Paul and the team did immediately. And today, God may be speaking to you that there is a nation, there is a people group that you need to get involved. And I pray that you will respond Immediately, immediately they went. This year, there was a Love Singapore Summit where many pastors are saying this, that the harvest is now for Japan. There are many young people that have lost their hope in living. So there are many suicides among the young. But today, there are many of these young people turning to Christ. The time is now for Japan. The harvest is now, but the laborers are few. I do not know whether God is calling you, but in Love Singapore Summit, the pastors took up the stage one after another, sharing about this clarion call for Singaporeans to go there and do something. And finally, there was a Japanese who was there. He said that that morning he heard and he read about the Macedonia call and during the Love Singapore Summit, they talked about this Macedonia call. And he came up and he pleaded to Singapore. Plead to Singaporeans, come to Japan. I want, to, I want you to listen to what he's saying. Jeremy Sensei was in the middle of the 16th century, and I was in the middle of the 16th century, and I was in the middle of the uh, this morning, actually, um, God spoke to me through uh, Acts chapter 16. So this evening when Pastor uh, Jeremy opened the Bible verse, yeah, God gave him a confirmation. I, I know that uh, time is running tonight. But let me say something to you. 
私たちの国に渡ってきて私たちの日本に渡ってきて you come to Japan all the way from Singapore. 私たちの国を助けてください。Please help Japan. パウロがマ,マケドニア人の幻を見たように。Paul, uh, saw the vision to go to Macedonia. 皆さん、私たちの日本に来て。Please come to Japan. 私たちを助けてください。Please help us. When I was there, I was sitting right at the back and I was listening to this Japanese kneeling before 700 over Singaporean pastors and pleading, Come to Japan. You know, in Japan, there's a saying they are born Shinto, marry Christian, and die Buddhist. They are syncretistic, they believe in all religion. And so many, many years, missionary has gone there, and there's very little Christians. And so there is a call for us to respond. And so I, I went forward and I said, God, I, I'm pastoring here, but I know I have to do something for Japan. In fact, recently I started learning a little bit of Japanese. I'm hoping that every time, every trip that I go to, whether it's a holiday or it's a mission trip, I will see Japanese. I will befriend Japanese. I will try to share the gospel to them. I don't know about you, but God is calling us because you have heard many things already. You have been sitting on this pew or this seat very comfortably. But are you willing to just stand and say, God, I want to do something for missions? I want to do something for maybe some of those people that will never have a chance to listen to the gospel. Many are caught up in their own materialistic living. Many are caught up in their own world. But they do not know that there's a God who loves them so much. They do not know that their lives can be transformed only if they taste and see the beauty and the wonderful things that God has provided for them. Wow. And who? Will be the Herod who will hit the call. In a moment's time, we're going to sing the song, Make a Difference. I want you to make a prayer to God. And if you are ready, if today you have heard the message, you want to be involved, whether it's Japan, Bobonaro, or whether it's, it's somewhere, as a people group that God has put in your heart about missions, or maybe it's to the foreigners here in Singapore. If you want to do something, you make a commitment, God, I want to do something. I want you to respond as we sing this song. I want you to, once we come to the chorus, I want you to stand up as a way of responding to God. Say, God, I'm here. Help me as I serve others. Won't you, Lord? Won't you, Lord? Take a look. Take some time. If you want to respond now, you can respond by standing and say, God, I'm, I'm in. Use it for your plans, won't you, Lord? Take a look at us. Those of you who are watching online, maybe just as an act of obedience, if you feel like standing in your own bedroom, you know, you can just stand and worship together. As you stand, you are making a response to God. Say, God, I'm in. God, I want to do something. God, I want to make. My life count for your glory. Hallelujah. For a world without mission, we will make a difference, bringing hope to our land. Let's raise our hands and start from the top again. Won't you, Lord? Take a look at our hands, everything we have. Everything we have, use it for your plans. Won't you, Lord, take a look at our hearts? Mold it, refine it as you set us apart. We want to run to the altar and catch the fire. 
to stand in the gap between the living and the dead. Give us a heart of compassion for a world without vision. We will make a difference, bringing hope to our land. Father, you see the church has stood up in response to your word. And so we pray that we will respond immediately. Lord, Lord so many have been said, so much has been said, so many have said it, but yet so little has been done. And so teach us to be the hands and the feet that will respond to their call for mission. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing the chorus as a worship to God. We want to run. Hallelujah. We want to run to We have all heard the Macedonian call. Now we pray that God will give us the courage and the strength to give the Macedonian response, Lord. Lord, today as we have heard many things today, challenged by many things today, Lord, we have heard how we have become all things to all men in order that some might be saved. Today, Lord, we pray that you help every one of us here in the hearing of this sermon, Lord, to give the gift of a yes to you, Lord. Yes to missions. Yes to the lost. Yes to the needs. So Father, may you help every one of us today to not only say yes to you, to give to you, but to have the blessing and the joy of being part of the global end time harvest, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Use all of us. And now, Lord, we pray in your name, the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be with all of us and our families now and always. Always. Amen. Amen. God bless you. In Swahili, is a mungu aku bariki. In Luo, is a ogwedi nyasae. You know, I got to say this every week to my uh, African church. But I pray that you will say bless not just to one another, but to the lost. Amen. Amen. After this, if you came today dressed a bit like me in this, uh, I'm wearing a blanket. Huh? Uh, you, can you come forward? We want to take a picture with all those people who have all your cross-cultural costume. Some of you are dressed as a Singapore girl. I do not know if that's cross-cultural. And those who are <laughs> dressed like alien, also not counted. But if you are cross-cultural costume, please come forward. The rest of you, please join us outside at the mission booth to find out something a bit more. If you are a guest, please go to the uh, newcomer's corner so that we'll meet you there as well. God bless all of you. See you back next week.